Bibles open now to Ephesians chapter number 1. And we're going to move right along quickly this evening. We'll uh, recap very briefly where, where we've been here in the book of Ephesians. Get your Bibles out. Look at chapter 1 this, this evening. And uh, we're going to have to move right, right quick. The bad thing about doing a verse-by-verse study is so a lot of time preachers they get hung up on certain things. We've done come through a couple of things that you could get hung up, hung up on for weeks. Uh, like this doctrine, this Calvinistic stuff and the predestination. But all of y'all need to know what the Bible teaches about stuff like this. And here we are here in the book of Ephesians. So, so far, we have learned uh, so far that uh, uh, the book of Ephesians has six chapters written about 62 A.D., which means that was uh, 30, 20, almost 30 years after Jesus went back to heaven. So there was no, these old New Testament epistles like this while Jesus was here on earth. All they had was the Old Testament, actually. Other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John wasn't even written yet. And you've got to keep that in mind when you're reading it, that even though we're reading it, it wasn't wrote when that was happening. But don't ever forget that. And then we hit this, look at Ephesians 1 and verse number 4. We hit one of those controversial doctrines that preachers fussing over for years. And all the preachers, Sunday school teachers, everybody, every, every Christian needs to know what the Bible teaches about predestination. And uh, what we call a Calvinist. A Calvinist, they get their name from John Calvin. And he was uh, taught the doctrine of Tulip. That's why they describe the doctrine of Calvin as a tulip. T is total depravity. U, unconditional election. L, limited atonement. I, irresistible grace. P, perseverance of the same. Now, those first four are completely false, heresy, unbiblical junk. The last one can be partly true, perseverance of the same. If a man ever tells you that he's a two-point Calvinist, there's no such thing. If you're two, you're all. If you're three, you're wrong. So, because predestination, they believe that God, before the world began, already chose who would be saved. And deliberately did not choose the rest of them. Now, to get that from verse 4, look at it. See that in verse 4? According as He had chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame formula. You said, well, Brother Danny says it right there. He chose us before the foundation of the world. No, it don't. It don't say He chose us before the foundation of the world. Read it. It said, verse 4, He chosen us in Him. In Him. In Christ. You, did, you were not in Christ at the foundation of the world. The way it's worded will throw you. Uh, and, that's, and that's what happened to John Calvin. He didn't read it right. It don't say God chose before the foundation of the world to save amongst people regardless of anything. That ain't what it says. It said He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. So that means God, before the foundation of the world, chose to save everybody who would trust Jesus Christ. And the second you trust Jesus Christ, you are predestinated to become just like Him one day. That's what the doctrine of predestination really is. Predestination is a Bible doctrine. It's just after you're saved, not before. You are in Him. When was you in Him? Was you in Christ before the foundation of the world? No, no. You wasn't in Christ till you got saved, brother. And I wasn't either. Uh, if you was, if you was in Christ before you got saved, you wasn't even not. You wasn't not saved. You was already saved before you were saved. Uh, now that's uh, predestination. Then the you unconditional election. That means God elected to save a certain bunch of people uh, without with no concern of theirs or will of those of theirs at all. Unconditional election. That's also a false doctrine. Uh, the elect don't always mean the church. The elect can mean elect angels. It can mean elect Israel. It can mean uh, the elect church, and it can also mean the elect uh, saints during the tribulation. So that word elect don't always mean the. So if somebody says uh, that person Timothy says, 
I do this and that so that the elect may obtain salvation. You know, what they're saying is, I'm, I'm praying I do this and that so the elect will get saved. Listen, buddy, if that doctrine is true, the elect's going to get saved whether you pray or not. If, if I really believe, if I really believe that everybody's going to get saved, going to get saved anyway, I would knock myself out like I did. I wouldn't fast, that's for sure, buddy. And I would I, I I wouldn't I'd sell the buses next week and I'd cut off all our missionary support. Why? Why do it? If they're gonna get saved anyway. I go beat your knuckles on doors and get cussed out and have tracks thrown down. If if they're gonna get saved anyway, just live it up and have a good time, brother. We'll see you in glory. But that's not true. That's not true. I had a Calvinist come to me at, at New Manor one time years ago. He, he told me he said, I'm Calvinist. And I said, well, if uh, if we're if we're if everything is going to be saved, going to be saved anyway, what's the use of witnessing? And he said, just by being obedient. I said, so we know it ain't going to do no good or no harm. We just do it because God said to do it. He said, yep, I do it. I said, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, uh, unconditional election. And then L is limited atonement. Limited atonement means... That Jesus only died for the elect. Now listen. Somebody give me a verse that says something different than that. John 3.16. What does it say? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but right. have everlasting life. Okay, what they say, well that means God so loved the elect world. It doesn't say when he said the world, he meant the elect world. You're right, it don't say that. Now listen, you learn something right there. Anytime somebody has to put a word in a verse to make it teach what they believe, something wrong with what they believe. Amen. You listening? Did it learn something there, y'all. You don't have to stay in kindergarten your whole life, spiritually. All y'all people, learn this. When somebody has to, well, God, he means God so love the elect world. That ain't what it says. Uh, who... The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, but as long as we are not willing that any should perish, they said any of the elect. Yeah. See that? See what they're doing? Yeah. And the same way a Seventh-day Adventist does, same way a Jehovah's Witness does, when you put in a word that ain't there, or you take out a word that is there, or you take it out of context, that's the way you become a heretic. It don't say the Lord is not willing that any of the elect should perish. They, they're, going, they're not going to perish whether you, whether you will it or not. If, if that doctrine is true. And so make sure. I can show you in the Bible where the Bible said Jesus, blood, Jesus bought false prophets. He bought false prophets and false teachers. So the blood of Jesus. Here's what they say. They say, well, if Jesus died for everybody and a bunch of people didn't get saved and that means he's a failure. No. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't a failure. He done his job. I mean, they're a failure uh, for not responding. Who's what will? Who's what will? They believe that you can't even will to get saved but God has to do that for you. Yeah. See, if you're dead in trespasses and sin and you have absolutely no spiritual response in you at all, we're just stuck down here and hope he chooses us. Uh, it's funny to me that most most Calvinists, ones that I've ever met, I mean, and I do have some friends that way, but I don't know, you know, I, I ain't mad at them, we don't fuss about it, but um, it's funny to me that every one of them that believe that, believes that they are the elect, and their families, their wife and kids are all elect. What a coinky dinky. <laughs> Uh, it's like Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, they all believe that they're the 144 battle. Or the ones that say that they all believe somehow or another they're going to squeeze in. Uh -huh. What'd you say? You me? Yeah. They actually they don't all believe they're 144,000. But they believe they they're. Two separate groups. Yeah. yeah. That's the group that goes to heaven. Huh? They stay on earth. Yeah. Um, but all, all of believe that we have to afford to get the limited tongue. Then, then the I is irresistible grace. It means when the Holy Spirit convicts you, grants you, you can't resist it. It's irresistible. It snatches you up 
God saves you, and that night, that night you could have, that you got saved, you couldn't change it. It couldn't happen no other way. Uh, no, that's not true either. Acts said, you, you men, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. Yeah. As your fathers did on the cross. You can resist the Holy Ghost. Uh, uh, it, Baptist, Southern Baptist preachers are getting into this a lot. John MacArthur uh, is a strong Calvinist. He's got some good teaching, stuff like that. But uh, he messed up on this. Some of, the, some of your well-known preachers, like R.C. Sproul, Maybe y'all, you may yeah. hear him on the radio. I mean, Joe was talking about it a while ago. Uh, some guys like that. And even a lot of our Baptist camp meetings, you, a lot of these preachers say stuff like, they say stuff like, uh, I was running, I wasn't even looking for God, and the Holy Ghost arrested my soul. And the high sheriff of heaven, that makes good preaching and everything. But uh, the truth is, he didn't come and arrest you and drag you in and say, that ain't right. Uh, he don't make you come. You come on your own or you don't come at all. Amen. You come willingly or you don't come at all. Uh, so anyway, we studied that the last two weeks. You're not here. We've got to go a little bit deeper. But let's move on tonight. Down there in verse number 11. It said we've taken an inheritance. Be predestinated. We're predestinated after we're saved. As soon as you get saved, you are predestined to go to heaven. And we got into all that. So let, we'll start tonight with verse 12. Quick to tonight, let's look at this. Look at verse 12. That we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Now what does that mean? Verse 13. In whom, Jesus, ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. We'll stop there because it gets into some good stuff after the second part of that verse. But let's look at that first word, trust. There tells you what you did to get saved. You know what you did to get saved? You trusted the word of your salvation. The gospel truth. The gospel. Now, I'm not trying to trick you or embarrass you or nothing. But if somebody asks you right now, take a Bible and show them what the gospel is. I doubt if half the people in here can do it. You know what the gospel is. The good news is Christ died for sin. But I doubt if half the people in here can show me in the Bible. I'm not trying to be ugly or embarrassed. I couldn't have either for a long time. Uh, but if I said right now, somebody show me what the gospel is in the Bible. Could you do it? I will show you. It's 1 Corinthians 15. It's 1 Corinthians 15. Here's your definition of the gospel. Now remember this. Because you're going to need it one of these days. Talking to somebody. 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, look at it. Please. You did not get saved because you changed your ways or turned over a new leaf or just quit drinking or nothing like that. Here's how you got saved if you got saved. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. Here it is. Which I preached unto you, which I received and wherein you stand, by which also you're saved. If you keep in memory of what I preached unto you. Now, hold it right there to a second. There's another verse. Remember what I told you about? You've got to be careful how you read the Bible. Look at that verse there. Look at verse 2. By which you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you. What if you don't keep in memory? You see what I'm saying? What if you forget? You're not saved no more? Plenty of Christians get Alzheimer's and wind up in rest homes and stuff and don't even, don't even remember being saved. What that? you got to learn how to read the Bible, people. You gotta learn how to read it. It'd be like me saying, uh, "It'd be like me saying, all right, we're gonna have a, a Molly birthday party.' If you remember, if you remember what I told you a while ago, see that? You understand? It don't mean if you don't remember, it, we ain't gonna have it. We're gonna have Molly birthday party. If you remember me telling you about that, see how I said that? You're saved if you remember what I told you about." It. It don't mean if you don't remember it, we're not going to have a party. Am I confusing y'all? No. Okay, yeah. Does you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. He, he's not saying if you don't remember it, you're not saved no more. The second you put remember it, you lose your salvation. No. That's what it says. By which you're saved, if you keep remembering what I preached on you, then you don't mean that. That's not what it means. He, you've got to learn how to read it right. 
You say, well, Brother Danny, you just said a minute ago, I didn't add nothing to it. I didn't take nothing away from it. I told you in the sense, my job is to help you understand the sense and the understanding of the Scripture. We'll see more about that in a minute. Right, right quickly, the Gospel. Verse 3, here's the Gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. Here's the Gospel. How that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That's the first thing you ever know of the Gospel. Christ died for our sin, not just some wild tale, but according to the Scriptures. And that He was buried. And that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. There's the definition of the Gospel. That's the definition of the Gospel. He said, I preached the Gospel to you, verse 1. If you keep in memory, verse 2. Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture. That He was buried according to the Scripture. That He rose according to the Scripture. It's all got to be according to the Scripture. It, it, the, his resurrection, according to the Scripture. His burial, according to the Scripture. Every bit of it is according to the Scripture. And, ladies and gentlemen, if you can get this through your head, you can be a shouting happy Christian tonight. You're not saved by anything else but by believing and trusting that gospel. Amen. You are trusting that gospel. That means this. If you have to die tonight, and you know you was breathing your last couple of breaths. But I, I know I done got my plan made, but I, I mean, I might go quick. Somebody might blow my brains off, hit the car, head on or something. But if I got time, I know what my last words are going to be. My last words are going to be, Lord, remember the blood that you shed for me on the cross. Amen. 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 Don't be one of these people who say, Lord, we've done wonderful works in my day. I went to church every Sunday. I don't know how going to get you over. The Lord... Remember, Christ died for my sins and I'm trusting in that blood. Amen. You can go to hell being a Baptist. A lot of them are going to hell. You can go to hell being a Methodist. You can go to hell being a Presbyterian or Pentecostal. The church of God, sitting to God, and baptized in Jesus' name, fire baptized, and got your words spelled backwards. You can go to hell. But you cannot go to hell trusting Jesus Christ, blood that He shed on the cross. It's impossible. So that's what it is. It's the gospel. Now let's go back to Ephesians. He said, that's verse 13, in whom you trusted, after that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now here comes a shout part of this verse. In whom also after that you believed, you got to say, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit, capital S, of promise. Glory to God. Hallelujah, brother. When you got saved, the Lord put the seal on you. You were sealed. And that, man, I've heard them old preachers preach on that. I, I remember hearing Brother Ed McAbee preach on that. And uh, uh, some of you ladies, I'm going to need you to help me now. Because they used to preach on that. And I'd hear them preach. And they'd say, Mama used to, to can. And she can uh, peaches. Or she can green beans. And I, I'm, my mom used to do it. And then heat that oil in them and put them, and put them in them, put them in them uh, uh, jar and screw that lid down on them. And that, that lid was round. See, so that they put that little flat thing on it and put it down like that. And he said, they said, how many ladies ever heard that? They hit yep. That's what he sealed, buddy. Yep. Son, that thing went. Amen. Like you flipped it like that right there. It went pop. Buddy, you can set that thing up. In the, in the smokehouse or in the basement somewhere. And five years later, they take that out and open it up. It's just as fresh as it was when you put on it. It's a seal. It's a seal. And that's what the Lord did to you when He saved you. He sealed you, brother. You're sealed. And I, and I mean, we may go through hell and half acre long before we get there in this flesh. And I'm telling you, one of these days, we get to let the Lord going to open it up. It'll be just as fresh as it was the night we got saved. Well, glory. Amen. I tell you what, I, I, when you got saved, you got on the little end of something big, baby. Amen. You cashed in. Amen. You got it, buddy. I mean, you got you got the goods if you're saved. Amen. You got the goods. Amen. Right. Uh, I, was, I was talking to me and Joe was talking today. And he's talking about uh, how good God been good to him. We got talking about being saved and how it's all going to be sealed and everything. And I tell you. Uh, 
But Joe, we may, like I said, we may go through high, hell high bigger before we get there. And we, some of y'all have been there, and I have, and we may go through some rough times getting there. But one of these days, everyone that believed and trusted and deceived will land safely. Like that ship, that illustration of that ship, they all land safely to land. Every one of God's children is going to make it. Every one of them. That's really seen. That's a seal. Look at verse 14. Which is the earnest of our inheritance. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. I love that. King James English. That pure English. That pure English. Uh, I'll give you some more on the other Bible. How they mess that up sometimes. But at pure English, the earnest of our inheritance to the redemption of the purchase of possession. What does that mean? Uh, earnest. That don't mean some goofy guy that made funny movies. <laughs> that is not what that's talking about. It's the earnest. That's what they think of. Earnest is uh, uh, when, when it's a legal term that lawyers use. When you go buy something, you put earnest money. Yeah. Like a down payment that secures to the, 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 uh, the, the colonies, and this colony, they just finally, finally about got up here. Yeah. Uh, they don't have everything here, but we look like, like this boat went over and helped them move in this morning. And uh, they're actually going to stay in here. Sleeping there tonight. Hallelujah, brother. Y'all, you wouldn't believe the place they got over there. Could not everybody here could, could live there. Uh, it's ponderous. <laughs> I'm kidding you. <laughs> I'm kidding you. Y'all, you want some company? Yeah. Y'all ought to go see where they live, really. Yeah. Right off exit 113. Now. It's unbelievable. That's the biggest house I've been in, I don't know how long. Two people. And I done, I see visions while I was in there. Two horses. Yeah. Uh -huh. Two horses. Yeah, two horses. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, they've got horses and going to have, they're, they're a horse barn nicer than most houses. <laughs> Brick. Brick. Uh, but anyway, uh, they probably put down, I don't know if y'all put down earnest money, you call them some kind of down payment or put a thousand dollars on a credit card or something, I'm sure uh, Coach T knows about that kind of stuff. Earnest money, they still call it that? Is that still in use today in 2022, that, that term, earnest money? That means I'm, I'm, I'm laying this away, it's mine, and I'm going to come back and get the whole thing, pay it off, the purchased possession. You know what me and you are? We're a purchased possession. He bought us. We weren't worth buying. Amen. 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 Anybody in here worth buying for the Lord Jesus? Lord have mercy. You know, people, people a lot of times say, well, I'm just sorry. I'm ashamed of the Lord. We, we got that great. If anybody ought to be ashamed of anybody, it'd be him ashamed of us. Not us, him. We ain't got nothing to be ashamed of. If anybody should be ashamed, he should be ashamed of us. But if he's not ashamed of us, we surely not ought to be ashamed of him. Now, that, 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 that purchased possession, that, that part, uh, it, it's like this. When you get saved, when you get saved, the Holy Spirit coming inside of my body tonight, I have a soul. Uh, regardless of what most preachers believe and teach, the Bible teaches that soul is in the same shape as this body. Amen. Sure does. That's what it teaches. The rich man in hell, his body was in the grave, and his soul was in hell, and he had a tongue, and he had eyes, and he could talk, and he could see. So your soul is just like your body, except it's inside. It's not like a peanut, like they try to make it, like a Casper or something floating around. It's inside your body, shaped just like your body. And the Holy Spirit, when you, before you're saved, you have a dead spirit. You're dead in trespass and sin and a live body. You just live for the flesh, do whatever the flesh wants to do. As soon as you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes in and it's called circumcision of the flesh. That's what circumcision is a picture of. And cuts you loose from your soul or from your body and He's inside you and you have a live spirit and a dead body. Now we're walking around in this body here. We're supposed to reckon this body dead. You know what I'm talking about? That's what the Bible says. Reckon yourselves to be dead. I'm supposed to treat old Danny here? He's dead. 
He don't get no rights. He has no right to do what he wants to do, go where he wants to go, say what he wants to say. My spirit is alive. My flesh is to be reckoned dead. When you get, before you're saved, you, you have a dead spirit and a live body. After you're saved, you have a live spirit and a dead body. Amen. And that's why you have a fight all the time. Now when the Lord comes back to get his purchased possession, our body turns into a new body and we get our new body the same time all them other people get their new body. The truth is, when the Lord comes back from heaven, He brings their souls with Him. Their body's still great. So their, new, their old body comes up, and the souls come down, and our body, we which were alive and remain, will be caught up together with them, meet the Lord and we all get our new bodies at the same time. That's the purchased possession, the church. The church. The church, which is His body. I, I think it says it down here. Uh, uh, I'm skipped down to verse 22. And I've put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. 23. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, quickly, quickly, I'm going to hurry. I'm going to try to actually finish chapter 1 tonight. About five minutes, seven or eight minutes. So, where the redemption of the purchased possession is when the Lord comes and gets what He bought and paid for on the cross. He comes to pick up His layaway, sort of like you do lay something away for Christmas. So you go uh, get it, and it's already paid for, but you go and go, go pick it up. The purchase of possession. Now, look at verse 16. I'm sorry, read 14, 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love to all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, Making mention of you in my prayers. So, so the Apostle Paul tells these people, he said, I'm mentioning you all the time when I'm praying. I'm praying. Now, what he does is he keeps writing, but he's writing what he's praying. And you'll see seven things here that he prayed for this church. A preacher ought to pray these seven things for his church. I pray for y'all. A lot of times I try to check my memory to see, see how good it is. And uh, you ought to try this sometime. I, I used to these guys tell me, they said, Danny, you got a photographic memory. And I said, what's that? And they said, once you see something, you don't ever get. And I said, well, you know, that's sort of true. But I, that ain't really good because there's a lot of stuff I wish I could forget. It'd be nice if you could just blip it out what you want to get. And, but I, I, don't, I usually don't forget that. But I just try to check my memory. So I'm going to pray and I like that. And I start right here. And I start Miss Desi. And I start going down through there, going in there. And I try to remember everybody that comes here on Sunday morning. Because I'm up here looking at y'all, and most of the time y'all sit about the same place. And I think, oh, oh, forgot so and so. Oh, oh forgot oh, so and so. And Paul was telling these people, he said, I'm praying for y'all. I'm praying for y'all. Sometimes we'll come up here and pray, like on a Saturday night or something. And you may think this is silly, uh, but I don't. I go around and I touch every single seat. Lord bless you. That person who sits there, Lord bless that person. I hear part, every one of them in here, lay hands on all these seats. And some of you, I stop for a while. <laughs> oh, I'm these people, these bad. Uh, well aware of what my family says. Uh, but, uh, uh, but anyway, uh, uh, seriously speaking, uh, he said, I pray this for you. And a preacher ain't worth a dime and don't pray for his people. And I pray for y'all, and I pray for your kids. I pray for your kids that are backslidden, they're out of church, and not saved. We got people coming here to church, maybe that your kid just got in trouble. We have some, not here tonight, but you got in trouble with the law. We got kids, people here, your kids are out of the will of God. And I try to pray for your kids. And here's what he prayed. Let's read this, and I'll, I'll be through. Here it is. Here's what I pray, he said. Verse 18, uh, 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. That's a good prayer. God, give these people wisdom and revelation and knowledge of Him. Uh, actually, the revelation is uh, the second part of that prayer. Wisdom and knowledge is the first part of the prayer. And uh, that's a good prayer. If 
I pray for y'all. I should pray. Lord, give them wisdom. Give them knowledge. Uh, it, it, it's discouraging for a preacher, for people to come to the church five, six, seven, eight, ten years and still don't know a bit more than they did ten years ago. Amen. That's discouraging. I'm telling you. Are you going to try to have something fresh three times a week, fresh right out of the oven, and not repeat myself all the time and feed the Lord God? And then it'd be like y'all coming to me and I'd say, Brother Danny, what is the gospel? You know, it's how does it go? I'm just wasting my time. And, and that happens a lot. That happens a lot. So grow. I'm, I'm praying God will give y'all wisdom and knowledge. And then what he said? Revelation. Revelation. That means something revealed to you. Revealed to you. You know, I'll never forget. Uh, and Joe's talking about that. Joe's telling me about before he came here, when he's out in Arizona or somewhere working out there, about, he, he said he was listening to some of the preachers I mentioned to him a while ago. And he said, and it began to clear up his mind. And it says, like God revealed it to him. About the King James Bible, right? They tell you what you said. He said, God showed me. And you know, I believe it. The Lord shows you the right Bible. Right. He'll reveal it to you. Yeah. A lot of people say, well, I don't see what the difference is. You know what they're They've never seen it. They've never had it revealed to them. When I first got saved, somebody handed me a living Bible and said, here, Danny, read this. And I remember reading it, and I, you know, I mean, it was okay and everything, but I always thought, when it's time to read my Bible, I grab the King James. And I didn't a bit more know which one was right. The man in the moment. For some reason, instinctively, I said, that's the real Bible. Amen. And this is like stories of the Bible. That's the way I looked at it. And nobody told me that. And it was it was years before I knew why I believed it. I knew why I believed it. Uh, you know, Dr. Ruckman used to say they blamed it on him. He said, oh, you're just following Ruckman. On. Listen, they was, they was millions and millions of people believed the King James Bible was the Word of God in America before Ruckman was ever born. He just, he just showed them why they believed it. And he definitely did that. God gave him that that gift, that ability to do that. Thank God that he did. Because we can defend ourselves. But he, he, every Christian, if you pray about it, the Lord will lead you and reveal to you what his word is. And look at, uh, look at, I love this verse. Look at verse 18. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Oh my goodness. You can't see it. It's like people, it's like people who, uh, who, uh, I don't know, I don't know, I'm trying to tell you, maybe you can't, uh, it'd be like people who, some of the government or politicians and stuff, and they, uh, I don't know, I, I'm just, anything, gay marriage, abortion, anything like that, and they just honestly say, this is this, this, and you think, why can't they see that? They have no, their eyes have never been enlightened. Once you once your eyes have been enlightened, buddy, you see it then you can't unsee it like they say. It's it's there. You can't get out of it. You can't you can't uh, you can't deny it anymore once you see the truth. Once you see the truth, you say, I, I can't I can't deny that. And that you may know what is the hope you call it. Like like salvation, like the world, like the mysteries that Paul wrote about. He said, The Lord has to show you this stuff. You, you don't just get it because you're Educated. The Lord shows you stuff. And you know, I tell you this too. I'm not trying to sound superstitious or, or, or um, spooky, but if you read your Bible and pray, the Lord will show you stuff in here. Amen. He'll give you stuff. You, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be a prophet or some book writer or nothing like that. The Lord can show anybody in your stuff right out of His Word if you'll seek Him and let, and let Him. He said, Paul said, I pray this for you. And what if 19, the exceeding greatness of his power uh, toward us to believe, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places. Verse 21, shout the ground, y'all. Far above all principality, power, might, dominion, and every name that is named, not only this world, that which is to come. Glory to God, he put all things under his feet. Give him be the head over all things of the church. You know what that principality of power is? Look back at chapter 6. Look at chapter 6. And you'll see it. And, I, I, and I'm done. Chapter 6. Uh, let's see here. Where's it at? Verse chapter 6. 12? Yeah. We wrestle 
will not, like a wrestling match, against flesh and blood. blood. So it ain't politicians and the Pope and stuff like that. People say, well, they big men up in high places. It's not flesh and blood. It's not flesh and blood. But against principalities, powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Demonic spirits and power. That's what we're wrestling against, y'all. And things are floating around, flying around like birds. Pictured by birds. And you can see it. You can see it. I noticed uh, uh, Kelly, she kept saying, she keeps saying little things like that. She keeps seeing stuff. The other day she had seen something. I forgot what it was. What was the other day you seen? She said, this is a picture. Remember and I said, see that? Remember that? Huh? Yeah, what was that story? Yeah. Yeah. There you go. And see, she told that, and then she thought, oh my goodness. See, the eye, you know the understanding? The Lord says, follow me and I'll show you not to have to get mud on you. Yes, See, you follow me and you'll stay out of this mud of this world. Just little stuff like that. Little <laughs> stuff like that. The Spirit will enlighten you. If you're not, if you'll watch everything, you see some spiritual in it. Yep. And you know you're getting right when you start making some kind of spiritual application out of everything. And you know you're getting right you start seeing. And like I say all the time, everything you can see is pictures of something you can't see. It's true. All right, I'm done. I didn't mean to take this long, y'all. I want to finish this chapter tonight. We, we get hung up in there for months. Yeah. Anybody want to say something right quick? Yeah, you were talking about the two of the doctrine of Calvinism and everything earlier. You know, that's really nothing new. It's huh? been around since the church. Though, you know, at the beginning of the church, there are people that believe that the only the Jews could get saved, the Gentiles could get saved. Yeah. Know? The apostles had to straighten them out, you know. Right. The Jews, you know, the certain people were going to heaven, certain people were going to hell with that were chosen, you know. Mm -hmm. And and you know, if you look in where do you go preaching from? The Ephesians, you go over to three sixteen, you know. But Paul, Paul had to tell the Ephesians, the Gentiles, that the Gentiles were fellow heirs with them. And, and and you look in Acts at the house of Cornelius. What happened to that? At the house of Cornelius, right. Peter has to give an account for in the next chapter, yep. in Acts chapter eleven, right. you know, saying that yes, these were Gentiles, but yes, God accepted them. Amen. Yeah. Amen. It's, it's Amen. Now, if you listen tonight and you've got this, what I've showed you tonight, you right now know more than eighty percent of the religious world. That's how crazy this world is. 80% of the people in this world think that you go to heaven by being a good person. Yeah. Yeah. They really do. You don't believe it? Go out there, take a survey. Go in Morgan and say, we're taking a survey. How do you go to heaven? Well, you be a good person. Do the best you can. 8 out of 10. Yeah, you won't true. find 1 out of 50 that'll say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Yep. And, and we're in the Burke County Bible Belt. Anybody else? Right quick. All right. Let's all go to the party. Stand, please. Anybody got 